Good morning. Good morning. Uh, we have a rather special service this morning. This morning we are gathering together in the presence of the Holy Triune God. We gather to worship and praise His holy name and to learn from Him in His Word. And throughout the years, Christians have worshipped in a variety of different ways. There is no one prescribed method of worship shown to us in Scripture. The Lutheran Church, however, does use a formal liturgy in our worship services, not because we think it's the only way to worship, but because we believe that a liturgical service leads to a more reverent attitude when approaching the Lord in worship. Jesus himself tells us that where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. A liturgical service helps us keep in mind that we are standing in the presence of Almighty God even right now. So this morning, while we are doing something a little bit different, we are actually following the same exact liturgy that we do almost every single other Sunday. As we are going to be following this order of service, we do have a narrator. If you look through your bulletin, you'll see the word narrator appear several times. Mr. John Keeney has graciously offered to stand up and narrate the portions of the service as we come to them. What I would encourage you to do this morning, every time we get to the word narrator, as John goes forward through to the next sections, and he's explaining each section that's coming up to look at it, to look at the title, to look at what we're about to sing and the words we're about to say, and listen to what he is saying, and recognize that we are taking a journey through this worship service. It's not always a journey of emotion, but it is a journey of substance. Now keep in mind that the liturgy is just as important to our service as the scripture readings or the sermon. Because, yes, while God's word is in the scripture readings and in the sermon, God's word is also throughout the entire liturgy. I hope that this narrative service this morning will help us learn to recognize the importance of our liturgy, to grow throughout the service and to appreciate it, and to come before the Lord in his service with pure hearts and repenting of our sins and gathering around his throne for grace and forgiveness. So first off, I'll introduce the first few elements of the service. We will begin our service, as we do every service, with an opening prayer in which we ask the Triune God to bless our worship and to increase our knowledge in him as our one true God and all that he's done for us. Then we will continue with hymn 16. Sometimes the hymn selection might seem arbitrary to you, but I do put a lot of work in figuring out what hymn was going to go where and how it's going to fit into the theme of the entire service. That is also the case with hymn 16. This is a hymn of praise that asks for blessing from all three members of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We acknowledge in the hymn that we are here solely because of God's good grace, and we are here solely for the purpose of learning from God from his word. Because all of our service is gathered around God's word throughout the entire service. From the beginning of the liturgy to the end of the sermon to the end of the service, we will be growing in grace because of the word of God's presence there. So now we will begin our service with an opening prayer and then the singing of the first hymn. So we'll join in prayer. O oh Lord God, our Heavenly Father, not even the heavens, heaven of heavens can contain you. And yet you have chosen to be here with us who have gathered together in Jesus' name. We come into your presence with joy, for here, in your word, we see your love and receive your mercy. May our worship be pleasing to you, and may we be strengthened and blessed by your Holy Spirit. Hear us and bless us for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. We begin with our opening hymn, hymn 16.
the opening hymn, we continue with the Trinitarian invocation. By this we confess we are worshiping the true triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. At the same time, we ask the triune God to be with us and to bless us as we carry on our worship. Before we can draw near to worship our holy God, we must first, first of all cast off all our sins. As the psalmist reminds us, who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. So we come with penitent hearts and faith and confess our sin and unworthiness. Then we hear the pastor, as God's representative, speaking to us the words of comfort and forgiveness through our Savior, Jesus Christ. This assurance is given us in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You will notice that the pastor will frequently change positions. There is a reason for this. When the pastor faces you, this indicates that he is God's spokesman, and that through him, God is speaking to you. When the pastor joins you in facing the altar, this indicates that we are speaking to God together in prayer and praise. Please rise. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. true heart, and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. We poor sinners confess unto you that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against you by thought, word, and deed. Wherefore, we flee for refuge to your infinite mercy, seeking and imploring your grace for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. O most merciful God, who has given thy only begotten Son to die for us, have mercy upon us, and for his sake grant us remission of all our sins. And by thy Holy Spirit, increase in us true knowledge of thee, and of thy will, and true obedience to thy word, to the end that by thy grace we may come to everlasting life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, has had mercy upon us, and has given his only Son to die for us, and for his sake forgives us all of our sins. To those who believe in his name, he gives the power to become the sons of God and has promised them his Holy Spirit. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. Grant this, Lord, unto us all. to enter into the holy place of God's presence, and that is what we do in the next section of the service. We begin with a responsive reading from the Psalms, which is especially selected to lift our hearts to worship and bring out the theme of our service. This morning, our responsive reading is taken from Psalm 70, which is a psalm of repentance to the Lord. We come humbly before the Lord, recognizing our lowly state. Yet, on the basis of God's undeserved love for us, we approach him asking him to keep his promises and to remember his covenant of love, which he made with us. After the introit, we join in the Gloria Patri, or Glory to the Father. It is a joint praise to the name of our triune God, God the Father, our Creator, God the Son, our Redeemer, and God the Holy Spirit, our Sanctifier. Next is the verse of the day, which serves to focus our minds on the theme of the day. Next, having been forgiven our sins, we join in a heartfelt prayer for mercy, the Kyrie eleison, which means, Lord have mercy. 
is not another confession of sins, but an expression of our emptiness without God and our need to have him come and fill us with his grace. We pray for God's mercy to fill all of our needs in life. The response to the Lord have mercy is the Gloria in Excelsis, that is, glory to God in the highest. The Lord has made mercy upon had mercy upon us. He has sent his Son to meet all our needs. Therefore we join in singing the great song of praise to God, like the angels sang when God first sent his Son. Glory be to God on high and on earth, peace. Goodwill toward men. The words of this hymn are very precious as they praise God the Father for sending his Son, who hath our race befriended. Through this gift of his Son, the strife that divides us from God, our sin, has been taken away and peace restored. We lift up our hearts and our voices, responding to swell the chorus of the saints through the ages as we praise our triune God for his incredible gifts. Please rise. Before we get there, I would like to apologize. I see that the Gloria Patri and the Kyrie were swapped in your bulletins, so when we get to the Gloria Patri, go to the verse that is at the bottom of the page and sing Glory Be to the Father, and then when we get to the Kyrie, go back to the top of the page and we'll sing Lord Have Mercy, just to bring that to your attention right now. We continue with the introit from Psalm 70. Have regard for the covenants, O Lord. Let not the downtrodden turn back in shame. Arise, O God, defend your cause. Do not forget the clamor of your foes. O God, why do you cast us off forever? Why does your anger smoke against the sheep of your pasture? Remember your congregation, which you have purchased of old, which you have redeemed to be the tribe of your heritage. Remember Mount Zion, where you have dwelt. Do not forget the life of your poor forever. Let the poor and needy praise your name. from Psalm 88, verse 1. Alleluia. O Lord, God of my salvation, I cry out day and night before you. Alleluia. Lord, have mercy upon
to now we have opened our lips in prayer and praise to our triune God. Now we fall silent, for our Lord himself will now speak to us. He will reveal himself and his will to us in the reading and preaching of his word. This is the source of all that we believe and teach. Without the word of God, our worship, as well as our faith, would wither and die. This morning we listen to God speak to us in two separate readings, both taken from the New Testament. The first selection is from an epistle. The second is from a gospel. Both readings focus on the specific theme for the day. Our epistle lesson for this morning comes from Galatians chapter 3. We'll be reading verses 15 through 22. The Apostle Paul takes us through a brief history lesson this morning. He says that God had made the promise to send a Savior to Abraham some 430 years before he gave the law on Mount Sinai to Moses. It was also several thousand years after God gave the first promise of the Savior to Adam and Eve. He says that giving of the law does not nullify the promises that he made about the Savior before that. No, rather they go to serve the promises that he made. So it is important for us today to hear the word of God in the law, to recognize what it says about us, namely that we are sinful, and it also serves the gospel because only when we have been struck by the law can we turn to the Lord in true repentance and ask him to forgive all of our sins, which is what we find in the gospel. So we read from Galatians chapter 3, verses 15 through 22. To give a human example, brothers, even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it has been ratified. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, which is Christ. This is what I mean. The law, which came 430 years afterward, does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. For if the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by promise, but God gave it to Abraham by a promise. Why then the law? It was added because of transgressions, until the offspring should come to whom the promise has been made, and it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Now an intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. For if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. But the scripture imprisoned everything under sin, so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Here ends our epistle lesson. Our gospel lesson comes from Luke chapter 10. We'll be reading verses 23 through 37. This is one of the most familiar parables in scripture, the parable of the Good Samaritan. Here we have a man who comes to Jesus and asks a rather poor question. He says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? A flawed question from his very start. Jesus plays into this question and says, you know what the law says, go and do it. The man does know what the law says. Love God, love your neighbor. The man, sensing that he hadn't been able to keep the law, however, tries to justify himself saying, but who is my neighbor? perhaps lowering the bar and making it seem that he can love his neighbor, but you know, he doesn't love everyone, sure. Jesus then tells this parable about a Samaritan showing love to a man who is in need. Now notice at the end of the parable, it's almost like Jesus doesn't answer the question. The man says, who is my neighbor? Who should I show love to? Jesus flips the question around and says, who is this man a neighbor to? Through the parable, Jesus is showing us that we cannot keep the law, and that we are the man that is poor and dying in the gutter. To be saved does not revolve around keeping the law and showing love to your neighbors. To be saved revolves around being found by the one who was the perfect neighbor, who exemplified perfect love, and that's Jesus Christ, the perfect good Samaritan. We read from Luke chapter 10, verses 23 through 37. Then, turning to, to the disciples, he said privately, Blessed are the eyes that see what you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings desired to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, 
What shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers, who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three, do you think, proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. Here ends our scripture readings. We have heard God's word. Now we respond by confessing that we believe about the work of our triune God in the Apostles' Creed. By this we show that we have received God's word in faith, and we accept and confess for ourselves everything that God teaches us in the Bible, which is summed up in the statement of faith. We then sing another hymn, usually expressing in song the thoughts of the scripture readings and sermon. This morning we will be singing hymn 439, which is based on the words of our gospel reading from Luke. <coughs> Notice how the initial focus is entirely on Christ that he is the one who came to die for us, and that he is the one that can teach us to love one another accordingly. We proceed asking that he grant us the faith to show love to our neighbor whenever the opportunity presents itself. Finally, we ask the Holy Spirit to be with us and to sanctify us as long as we live until the day we are united with God in heaven. Through the sermon, God speaks to us through his called servant, the pastor's sermon is not just a number of offhand remarks, but a prayerfully prepared proclamation of God's message of repentance, <laughs> salvation, and growth in faith. The pastor greets you with the salutation, which the Apostle Paul often used at the beginning of his letters, asking the Lord's blessing upon those who hear his word preached. At the conclusion of the sermon, the pastor speaks the votum. With these words from Philippians chapter 4, verse 7, he invokes the blessings of God's peace upon all who have received God's word. Will the congregation please rise? We'll join in confessing our Christian faith following the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of everlasting. Amen. You may be seated for the next hymn, hymn 439.
Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, dear fellow redeemed. The text that I will be laying upon your hearts this morning comes from Zechariah chapter 7. We'll be reading verses 4 through 10. Then the word of the Lord of hosts came to me, saying, Say to all the people of the land and to the priests, When you fasted and mourned in the fifth and seventh months during those seventy years, did you really fast for me, for me? When you eat and when you drink, do you not eat and drink for yourselves? Should you not have obeyed the words which the Lord proclaimed through the former prophets when Jerusalem and the cities around it were inhabited and prosperous and the south and the lowland were inhabited? Then the word of the Lord came to Zechariah saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Execute true justice, show mercy and compassion everyone to his brother. Do not oppress the widow or the fatherless, the alien or the poor. Let none of you plan evil in his heart against his brother. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who loves us in spite of our sins, dear fellow redeemed. When you get the mail out of your mailbox, you have to sift through and pull out all the junk mail, and I'm sure that usually that just goes straight into the trash. But sometimes if you look at the junk mail, you will see some rather outrageous offers. I know in the past I've received junk mail from local jewelers, and on the front of it, sometimes it'll say something along the lines of this genuine 24-karat gold necklace, yours, for a price that's usually well south of $100. Which, wow, 24-karat gold, less than $100, that is a steal. I better get right over there and buy that. Of course, there's a catch. It's not really solid 24-karat gold. It's just gold-plated. See, with today's technology, modern jewelers are able to take a cheap metal and then coat it with a very thin coat of a precious metal like 24-karat gold. But if you buy said necklace and then take a piece of sandpaper and sand it down a little bit, you will see that just below the surface is a much cheaper metal, usually brass or copper or maybe even stainless steel. You know, that's a problem that we as Christians often have as well. There are Christians in the world today that are careful to preserve a shiny plating of a Christian lifestyle on the surface, being outwardly kind to people, going to church regularly, doing all the things that make us look good on the surface, when in reality, the bulk of many Christians' lives is made up of much poorer stuff. Through the, prophet Isaac, through the prophet Zechariah, God is taking Israel to task for this very thing this morning. And I wonder, does his, do his criticisms of Israel apply to you and apply to me? Let's look carefully at our text this morning, and then we'll look below and look at ourselves and our own Christian lives. Our theme for today is scratching the surface of faith. Is your faith just a cover-up? Christ makes it solid through and through. Zechariah was a prophet during a very important time period in Israel's history. It was during the time when Israel, who had been in captivity in Babylon, was sent back to their own country. That was when Zechariah came around. Well, those who had been alive in Babylon, they lived there as slaves, and they were stuck there for 70 years. During that 70-year time, the children of Israel were still able to uphold some of the religious festivals and feasts and other things that they had been doing all along in Israel. So, there were days during each month when they would fast, supposedly as a sign of their repentance, pleading with God to deliver them from the Babylonians. Then they would also have feasts and festivals, which supposedly they were gathering together to offer to the Lord. The Lord finally, after 70 years, sets them free brings them back down to their country of Israel. And when they get there, they approach Zechariah with a question. It's right before our text, and that's what our text is in response to. The question goes basically like this. Should we continue with those religious fasts and festivals and all the other things that we were doing while we were up in Babylon? Hey, to me, sounds like a good question. Makes a lot of sense. Now that they're finally back home, and they've built up their lives again, and they have jobs again, now would be a good time to resume their worship lives. 
going back to church and going back to the feasts and the festivals and resuming their fasts. On the surface, it seemed like a good question and something that the answer should just be, well, yeah, obviously do it. Apparently, it was not a good question because their feasts and their festivals and their fasts did not come from a heart of love for the Lord. You know, God saw right through these things and saw that all of their worship was really a cover-up for a thin, gold-plated faith. See, God's answer isn't what we expect. They ask him, Lord, do you want us to come back and start worshiping you again? And he responds in anger. He sees right through their inflated piety. He sees right through their outward demonstrations of love for the Lord. And he asks them a few questions which get right to the heart of the matter which scratch off the surface of their faith and reveal what they were underneath. He says in verse 5, When you fasted and you mourned for me in the fifth and the seventh months during those 70 years, did you really fast for me? For me? And when you eat and when you drink, do you not eat and drink for yourselves? The answers to these questions were obvious. They had not been fasting because they were sorry for their sins. They were fasting for their sins because they thought it made them look good. Because to all the other people that saw how pious they were and how repentant they were, they thought, wow, what a good Christian. God says when they were gathering together for the feasts, it was not out of love for the Lord. It was because it was a good time. There was always plenty to eat and drink at the festivals. You'd have to be crazy not to go. God responds to them. He says... Should you not have obeyed the words which the Lord proclaimed through the former prophets when Jerusalem and the cities around it were inhabited and prosperous? God is telling them that they had plenty of time to listen to his word and to learn what true religion was all about. He had been sending the prophets to them to show them that true religion was not just going through these outward forms and these outward rituals and obeying certain outward laws. He showed them that they had not followed through. He sent the prophets to them to preach to them a message of repentance so that they, with their entire heart, could turn to him, confess their sins, and plead for forgiveness and trust in him as their savior rather than themselves. He taught them that true religion is not just what you do at worship, but what you do throughout your entire lives. True devotion to the Lord in real kindness toward your, towards your neighbor. But the Jews didn't get the lesson. They never were really listening. See, it was much easier to just go through the outward motions of religiousness than actually truly believing in their hearts. They went right on with their feasts and their festivals. They kept on fasting because it made them feel good and it made them look good. Now, it looked good from the outside. In fact, by the time Jesus came, they'd even gotten better at all of these outward signs. We know that at the time of Jesus, the Jews, every good Jew anyways, would fast twice a week. Every Monday and every Thursday was a fast. It looked really good on the surface, but God saw right through it. And that's why Jesus said to them in Matthew chapter 15, Hypocrites! Well did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, and in vain do they worship me. Jesus knew that their faith was a thinly plated faith. He knew that they were obeying the letter of the law, but they did not follow the spirit of it. Their faith was just gold plating. Looked good on the outside, but inside it was really rather, rather worthless. We need to shift our focus away from the Jews for a moment and start focusing on ourselves. Are God's criticisms of the Jews applicable to us? What about you? Is your faith merely a thinly plated faith or is it solid through and through? Well, let's examine ourselves. Do we come to church on Sunday because we want to hear God's word? Do we come to church on Sundays because we love our Savior and we know that we are sinners and we desperately need to hear the words from his mouth again that we are forgiven? Or do we come to church for another reason? Do you come perhaps because you want to look good to other people and you know they'll think badly about you if you're not there on Sunday morning? 
Do you come to church because someone's forcing you to be here? Do you come to church merely because there are friends of yours that you see here and you really only see them one day a week, so you better go to church so you can see them? Or do you perhaps go to church because it gives you the vague feeling that if you go to church on Sunday mornings, you're chalking up points with God, earning his favor, making him happy with you? Let's scratch a little bit deeper and see what our faith is really made of. I want you to do an exercise with me. I want you to mentally subtract from your weekly rituals. I want you to mentally subtract your weekly church attendance and the offering that you're going to put in the offering plate. And after you've taken out church attendance on Sunday mornings and your offering, what is left of your faith life? You really should have a whole lot left. In fact, the bulk of our faith lives should be seen on Sunday afternoons and in the six days before the next service. You ought to be able to see your faith shining not just from 10.15 to 11.15 on Sunday mornings. You also ought to see it in the way you act and live and speak and conduct yourselves the rest of the week. That's why Zechariah says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Execute true justice. Show mercy and compassion everyone to his brother. Do not oppress the widow or the fatherless, the alien or the poor. Let none of you plan evil in his heart against his brother. He is referring to a true religion, which is not just a Sunday morning thing, it's a seven day a week thing. I wonder if you're thinking what I'm thinking right now, and if you're feeling some of the same feelings that I am. I have not done enough. I have not lived the kind of faith life which my Savior requires of me. If I scratch deep enough, well, I don't even really have to scratch very far at all, and I see that deep down, my works are rather worthless. That's a terrifying thought, to think that no matter how good we look on the surface, that God sees right through it and can see that we are often made of much poorer stuff. How do we get rid of these shortcomings? How do we clean ourselves from the sins of our past and the terrible ways we conduct ourselves the other six days of the week? How can we find the motivation to live the kind of life which God calls us to? Well, the answer is obvious, and you all know it. It's turning to the Lord, begging Him for mercy, turning to the Lord in repentance and trusting that He will forgive us, Turning to the one whose love was not just a thin plating on his surface, but whose entire being was love. Turning to the one who lived not just seven days a week, but all 33 years of his life so that he could save sinners like you and me. Through him, we do have a faith that's not just a cover-up. Through him, we have a faith that is solid through and through. I was reading a little bit ago and. Don't ask me why, I can't remember, but I was reading about colonial Australia. And if you know about the history of Australia, you know that it was founded as a, basically a large prison for the British Empire. They would take the most dangerous convicts from around the British Empire and ship them off to Australia. And there they would work. They would build the infrastructure for what would soon become the British colony of Australia. And when they would work, building roads and train tracks, they had to wear these irons around their legs, chains. They could only really move their feet, a, their, their feet a little bit at a time. They were tied together in a row. They had a heavy weight at the end, making it impossible to separate themselves from their guilt. They were tied to it. They would never be able to escape. Sometimes that's what a Christian's life feels like. Sometimes you feel, very ch you feel chained very tightly to your sin of your past. You feel connected very strongly to the guilt which lingers so much on our hearts. Well, that's the reason Jesus came, isn't it? To cut the chain which binds us to our sin. Jesus came so that he could take that weight which burdens us so much and carry it with him to the cross. Jesus came with the power and the strength to do something that only God could do. To take all of our sins, every single one of them, and pay the price to take them away on the cross, shedding his own blood in the once-for-all atonement that we needed. He has set us free 
from the awful weight which holds us back. He has set us free from the guilt and the sin which prevents us from moving forward in our Christian lives. He has set us free so that now we can live for him. Isaiah says, words of comfort to you and me, he says, Come now, let us reason together. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. In Christ Jesus, every single new day is a new start. When we feel the weight of our sins, God encourages us to come to him and confess our sins to him and plead for his forgiveness. And his answer is that if we are faithful and just, he will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He's saying there doesn't need to be anything holding you back. There needs to be no guilt clinging to you. You are free to live the lives of children of God. And now when God scratches the surface of your faith to see what is beneath it, he doesn't see a worthless metal below. He sees Christ's righteousness. That's why he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Dear friends in Christ, you have been gifted a faith which is not just thin plating. You have been gifted a faith that only our loving Savior Jesus Christ can give us. Because when God looks at us on the basis of our seven-day-a-week lives, it would look pretty worthless. But instead of doing that, God looks at us on the basis of his Son. He sees us through Christ's blood. He sees us wearing Christ's robes of righteousness, and scraping through, he sees that we are 24 karat gold Christians, solid all the way through. Now, they say whenever a poor person, a poor man, becomes wealthy, one of two things happens. Either he will become miserly and a penny pincher, or he will become generous, sharing his wealth with all because he knows what it's like to be poor. I wonder what we will do. Because Jesus has made each one of us wealthy beyond our wildest dreams. Through him, we are now called God's dear children. Because of Jesus, God says that you have a great inheritance waiting you in heaven, eternal life. So what will we do with these wealth, with these riches, with this wealth? Will we hoard it away and keep it locked up tight in this building, only taking it out to polish it up for one hour on Sunday mornings? Or will we be generous, living a seven-day-a-week faith, sharing God's love with the people we meet every day? If it were up to ourselves, I know which one we would choose. Thanks be to God for sending his Holy Spirit into our hearts and granting us true faith, for granting us the foundation of faith being Christ Jesus crucified for our sins. May the Holy Spirit continue to work in our hearts so that going forward, we live just as Christ lived, loving God and loving our neighbor as ourself, and ultimately going back to Christ every time we fail, trusting in his abundant forgiveness. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. You may remain seated. And the peace of God, which surpasses all our understanding, will guard and keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We have listened to God's word as it was read and preached. He has spoken to us in mercy and blessing. Now we offer to him our hearts and lives that he might make us eager and strong to do his will in thought, word, and deed. In the offertory taken from Psalm 51, we confess our humble and grateful acceptance of the word and pray that God will use the word to create a clean heart and right spirit within us, a heart that is willingly and freely Given, given ourselves to God. Mm-hmm. Following the offertory, we sing a hymn that reinforces the thoughts of the sermon and helps us to reflect on the truths that we have just heard. This morning we will be singing verses from hymn 366 in which we confess that there is only one thing needed, the treasure which God bestows upon us through his word. Although we might like to turn to entertainment and possessions for our happiness, Only one thing offers pure joy, and that is the knowledge of the blood shed on the cross to buy our salvation. Believing that heaven is truly ours, we have reason to rejoice today. 
After the hymn, we, who have been strengthened and purified by the word of God, bring our offerings from thankful hearts to the Lord God. Our offering is also a meaningful part of worship of God when it is given out of thankfulness for God's countless and priceless blessings. When the offering is gathered, the usher brings it to the Lord's altar, and we sing a hymn signifying that our offerings are truly a gift from the Lord, and that we are now offering them to him, not just out of necessity for the work of the church, but out of love for God. In the prayer which follows the offering, we come before our triune God with prayers of thanks and praise for what he has done. We plead for God's grace and mercy for all our needs and the specific needs of individuals. And we also pray for the needs of others around our synod and around the world. Continue with hymn 366, verses 1, 2, 5, and 6.
A number of prayers have been requested this morning. First of all, we pray for the youngest member of our congregation, Emmeline Goodwin. Uh, last night, Emmeline took a fall, and she had some complications from the fall. She is in the hospital right now in Tampa, at St. Joe's, I believe. Um, things look like they should be good, but it is still a scary situation. They did see something on her brain in an x-ray, um, so we pray that the Lord would um, be be with her and be with the doctors and that they would um, know what to do and know how to, how to handle the situation. Also, I would like to ask for prayers of thanksgiving to the Lord. Um, last night, my brother and sister-in-law just had a baby, a, a new niece, Lucy Rodebaugh. Um, we ask the Lord to bless them and be with, be with her and bring her to the waters life-giving and baptism, uh, hopefully next Sunday. Enjoy your prayer. Heavenly Father, eternal and almighty God, who kept your promise of grace to the world by raising our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead, grant us the gift of your Holy Spirit, that through your word he may work in us a true and living faith in you and your Son, Jesus. Make us unshakable in that faith, leaving behind any thought of earning your favor for ourselves, and turning instead to your grace, that pure holiness that you freely give on account of Jesus' death in our place. O Lord, since you have so loved us, work also in us a growing love in return for you, a love which shows itself by our behavior toward the people around us. Grant that we may always show compassion to those in need, honor to all people, and that we be patient and forgiving toward those who cause us grief and have genuine love for all. Help us never to strike back or to lash out or to get even. Rather, lead us to return blessing for curses and kindness for evil, just as our Savior did. Dear Heavenly Father, move us and all believers everywhere to have grateful hearts for all of your blessings. In gratitude this morning, Lord, we praise you for the safe delivery of, of Lucy Rodebaugh, our sister in Christ. We ask that you would keep her and her mother in your protective hands, and that you would bring Lucy to the waters of baptism for her rebirth, hopefully next week. Lord, in this same vein, we especially thank you for the gift of our greatest treasure, the gospel of Christ Jesus crucified for sinners like us. Send us forth to the corners of the earth to proclaim the good news of eternal salvation and prosper us as your ambassadors in all our labors. Lord, pour out your mercy upon all who are in trial or adversity, especially those who are suffering for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, Pray for those, we pray for those who are sick or injured, and Lord, deliver them by your mighty power. Lord, we especially remember our sister in Christ, Emmeline Goodwin. Lord, you know the problems that are facing her right now. We also know that you have power to make her well. Please be with her and the doctors and with her parents. Grant them comfort knowing that you are in control, and please bring her safely back to us. Now, dear Lord Jesus, Please forgive us our sins and cleanse us by your word, giving us the hope and promise through you of life everlasting. All this we ask in your holy name, the name in which we also join to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We are now ready for the conclusion of our service. The benediction is a blessing which God himself commanded to be spoken upon his people at the time of Moses, and it has been used in the church ever since. Through this benediction, the pastor is not merely wishing God's blessing for the congregation. The Lord, our trying God, has promised to give us his blessing through these words. Just as Jacob wrestled with the Lord and would not let go until God blessed him, so we will not want to leave God's presence without receiving the promised blessing. This benediction and our service close with one final word, peace. 
With the sign of the cross, we are reminded that God's peace is ours through the perfect life and sacrificial death of Jesus our Lord, in whom we trust and for whom we live. With the closing hymn and a moment of silent prayer, our worship is over. Our closing hymn sums up the thoughts of the service as a review of what we have heard. This morning we'll be singing hymn 398. With these words, we ask the Lord to remove our hearts of sin, and having forgiven them from our guilt and shame, to create in us clean hearts that gladly obey his word and will. With God's blessing upon us and his strengthening presence with us, we are ready to depart in peace. But our liturgy is not really over. For the word liturgy literally means service. Our whole life as Christians is to be our service, our liturgy to God. We are now ready to move out of church and into the liturgy of our daily life. Strengthened by our visit with God to be his witness and to do his will in our life. In this way, may his name be hallowed and his kingdom come also through us for Jesus' sake. Receive then with believing hearts the blessing from the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. 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 We close with our final hymn of the day, hymn 398.